This panel is advocating for FOSS inside companies, and uh, we had a similar panel on this last year, and it's all about companies that have formal organizations and policies around both inbound open source and outbound open source. And it's really fascinating to see how, you know, when maybe we started this dev room or perhaps a few years before that, um, this hadn't really become a standard practice. And now uh, companies are really embracing that, both from a organizational, maybe legal, defensive point of view, but also from a proactive outreach point of view and wanting to connect with and wanting to contribute to communities and want to, making, uh, want to make an impact and wanting to uh, get their name out as a good community citizen. So we're really lucky to have a suite of fabulous panelists to talk about this. I'm going to let each of them introduce themselves for a couple of minutes um, and talk about briefly about the, the issues that they're facing and things that are important to them. And then we'll be able to uh, dig into these issues in more detail. So I will start off with Charles. Okay. Well, thank you for, uh, for that uh, intro. Uh, my name's Charles Eckel. I work at Cisco. Um, within Cisco, we have something called our uh, DevNet team, our developer network. I'm, I'm part of that team. I'm one of the developer advocates in that team. So, you know, my job is really to help developers outside of Cisco um, understand our products, how they can use APIs that they have, how they can build on top of them, integrate with them. What better way to do that than, you know, by having things open? Open APIs is a good thing. Open source code is, is even better. Um, a lot of what I try to do is make it uh, easier for people to create and open source and then for people to find um, what I would call sample code, really. We do a lot with big open source projects, but another thing is if you just want some sample code that shows how to use an API, how to do an integration between component A and component B, if you can open source that and make it available for people to use, for me that's a, a great way to enable developers. And so a lot of the things that concern me are kind of around that goal. Thanks, Charles. Um, I'm Natia Ruff, and I run the open source program office at Comcast. Uh, we're based in Philadelphia, and uh, we are a company that's at the mm. intersection of media and technology. So we do internet services, uh, cable TV services, uh, content creation through NBC, Universal, DreamWorks, etc. Um, so Comcast, uh, you know, traditionally has been a company that acquired proprietary software and purchased products from vendors. And then around the 2000 time frame, we started consuming more and more open source because open source was so helpful. Uh, it helped us create our own solutions, get to market faster, be more innovative, etc. And then we realized that, that it's very important and good hygiene to start contributing back to open source, whether it was upstreaming or creating our own original products like content distribution networks, etc. So my job from an open source program office perspective is to make it dead easy for our programmers and developers in the company, uh, of which we have thousands now, uh, to both consume open source software, contribute open source software, collaborate with others, and really to create a culture of uh, open collaboration within and outside the company. Uh, hey, I'm Jeff McCaffer. I work at Microsoft and I run the open source program there. Uh, as you probably have noticed, Microsoft's been going through uh, quite a bit of change with respect to our open source uh, engagement. And it's uh, only in the last sort of three or four years that we started a formal programs office. Uh, it's, been, it's been really uh, very exciting, uh, pretty scary at times. And our biggest challenge, I think, really is culture. Uh, we've got a company that's full of really, really bright people who've been spending decades writing code that wasn't open source and, in fact, you know, was often quite opposite. Um, and so changing that business culture, changing the way we do things, the, the policies and the processes. When I started, you know, each person who wanted to use some open source, they had to answer 25 skill testing questions. And if they got one of them wrong, you know, they were, they were gone. So, and you know, now we've gotten down to some, uh, some really high automation rates and some of the tooling discussion earlier uh, that went on was you know, right dead on point. Uh, we really want to do open source. We really want to do it well. 
Uh, and so we've been trying to do that across consumption, releasing, contributing, uh, contributing back and supporting projects. And that's really what my team does, is try to help drive that uh, throughout the, uh, the company. My name is Dwayne O'Brien. I run the open source program at Indeed.com, the, the job site. Uh, and by the time you got to the end of the list here, I, I started off thinking I had maybe a unique take, but it's, it's not all that different. Um, what I didn't hear any of us talk about is companies really excited to release their own open source projects. A lot of the talk has been focused on getting employees involved and participating in the communities uh, uh, around the software that uh, we consume and that they're interested in. And that's where I focus a lot of the work that I do there. So uh, how do we get uh, developers both reaching for open source first as uh, an instinctive reaction when they want to implement something? Um, but also making sure that they're participating in the communities around the software that we use, not just contributing code back, but just being involved with the communities in the broader sense. Um, it's pretty much what, what turns it for me. I, I do. I'm going to switch to the other mic in just a second, but I, I, I ha have sort of a hidden agenda, so you'll, you'll, it'll make sense in a second. Uh, <laughs> There's mystery guest. Well, um, I, I, I wanted to follow up with that, uh, Dwayne, because it makes me think of a great question. So that's why I wanted, I wanted to grab the mic. I wanted to ask everybody to answer this question. Um, all of you mentioned, you know, uh, so, to some degree, this business of contributing back, the acknowledgement of the role that open source is playing in your companies. Let me challenge you. Let me ask you, how do you know when you're successful, what does it mean to be a good citizen? How do you measure it? Okay. Yeah, just so, and just to let you know, we didn't like, get a chance to talk about any of these questions beforehand. So we're all going to be thinking off the, the top of our head here. Um, you know, for, for me, I think uh, success comes from having. Um, you know, enabling the developers within my company to do their job and to do it do it well. And what I mean by that is, if, if you go back, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago, it was pretty hard to just release some software, just to put some software in the hands of your, you know, potential customer and user base. So everyone went through the, you know, the, the processes that Cisco put in place to put software out. Um, there was an ability to open source something, but th the ability to just put, to get any kind of software out, uh, a product, uh, you know, whether it's open source or closed source is a pretty difficult process, pretty arduous process. And then with things like, you know, GitHub coming around, it's, it's so easy now, even accidentally, to share code. And so uh, what I'm seeing is more and more people are putting code out there on GitHub, whether they're supposed to or not. Um, whether they understand what a license is or not, um, whether they really think through what they're doing. So a big part of what I'm trying to do is, is not stop them, but just to try to have a conversation with them, to educate them about, you know, do you realize if you don't put a license, you're not really doing someone a favor, you're actually hurting them, because now they have no license to use your stuff. And to a lot of people, that just comes as a surprise. Um, so, so helping people do what they want to do, but still do it the right way, right? To be a good open source kind of contributor and, um, as Dwayne was saying, a, a member of a community and not just, you know, be throwing a bunch of stuff out there. Uh, so a lot of what I'm doing is just trying to have that happen. It, it is difficult to measure, but I think just by looking at, you know, the, the amount of code that's out there and talking to our developer community and see, you know, are they able to find what they need um, that's how I'm kind of, you know, measuring okay. it. That's good. Miss you. Tom, um, I think it's going to be an ongoing journey, so it's going to be hard to know when we've reached it. Um, one of my, uh, well, things on my table is is a simple button, you know, like, like the kind you get at uh, stores. And uh, essentially, we want to empower the developer to make the right choices, as as Charlie was saying as well and not to be uh, you know, overloading them with policies and processes and, and you know, approval bodies and stuff. We want to build it into the build process, we want to build it into the software development processes, and we want the open source developer inside the company to be a first class citizen. 
So one of the things that happens is uh, many of us, our companies, award people monies and leather jackets, et cetera, for patent filings. And we want uh, open source software development to be just as well recognized in their uh, technical path to being a distinguished engineer fellow, et cetera, and, and also to get uh, monies associated with that. So, so for us, I think we're, we're looking to, I mean, to use the buzz phrase, you know, delight our customers. And our customers aren't just the people who pay us. They're also the people who are in our communities, in our ecosystems. And so by, you know, to, to your metric point, um, I, I'll say up front, we don't have a suite of metrics that, you know, if it goes above a certain thing, we're green and we're happy, we're done. It's very much a continuous process. But I look mm -hmm. at some of the code, the, some of the projects we put out there, uh, things like VS Code or TypeScript. I mean, these are widely widely used, people are thrilled with them, delighted with them, you know, using them all the time. And those folks walk around really feeling really tall and happy and really, really proud of what they're doing. And we want that to happen throughout our, our company, obviously, our developers, but also the people who are engaging with our products or our, or our, our open source projects as well. Uh, so we look at that as, you know, essentially customer satisfaction, right? How happy are people with the things that we're doing, whether it's our own projects or our contributions back uh, and, and our actual products? So I think the question, you actually asked two different questions, and one was what do you measure, and the other one was how do you know when you're done? Um, if I think about what it is that we measure, um, I have sort of a you know, earmarked goal of getting 50% of our engineers involved regularly in free and open source software, um, which uh, I think is a, as far as I can tell, it seems like a high number. Not a lot of companies publish like how many of their employees are involved in this kind of work. Um, I don't want to set the goal at 100% because for, for some people who've developed disciplines within certain languages or environments or stacks or communities, encouraging them and trying to force them into those communities might not be good for them or they may just not enjoy it like it's not participating in these communities can't be for everyone not everyone enjoys it the same way um, so driving participation and trying to get you know half of our engineers there that's really like that's what i'm sort of looking to to measure but the thing i'm looking for for how i know when i'm done is uh when the predominant instinct is to see a piece of free or open source software uh, that does 95% of what we want it to do, and having the developers decide that writing the remaining 5% of that and giving it back to the community is less work than trying to write 100% of a new solution, uh, which is a predominant instinct in a, lo in a lot of companies. Uh, and I think there's some, you know, there's a bit of, uh, oh, I could do this better. It's going to take, it's going to take two weeks. No problem. I can, I can absolutely outwork the 40 or 50 people who've been working on this for five or six years. And you'll get 80% of the way there, but we know how long the other 20% takes. No, I, th I think what you mean is that, um, you know, that's the first 80%, and then there's the second 80%. Right. <laughs> and, and, and then the third, <laughs> and, then, and then the fourth 80%. So, um, can you hear me? No, I didn't hear you. Can you hear me? Well, you can hear me, but let me finish that real fast. I don't think the video is going to Uh, oh, there we yeah, I think it was muted. That's why. It was unmuted. Uh, user error. Some, some people call that error 39. Um, so I have a question as a developer. Um, I want to ask you a, a question about your employees. And this is inspired by a podcast that Karen and Bradley did a long time ago on the Free and Freedom podcast, FIF.us, I'd recommend you look it up. And it was about this thing called the, yay, yeah, yeah, clap. It, it's, it's the contract patch project. And the idea, if you hadn't heard of it, was that when you join a company as a new employee, that's the moment when you have the opportunity, well, you have the most power in negotiating the terms of your employee contract. And if you're an open source software developer, one of the discussions that you have an opportunity to have with your employer is, can I keep copyright in the projects that I'm actively contributing to or that I will contribute to? Obviously, I would license the work, you know, you know, or maybe not obviously, but you obviously the, you could have the employee license the work uh, back to the company. Um, 
as a variation from the default work for hire uh, situation. And I, I think it's tough for all employees when you're, you're excited about a new job to enter into a discussion about terms of an employment contract because frankly it's scary and on the other side of the table are the lawyers or your manager, potential manager. Um, but it's, uh, my question is, uh, how do you welcome new employees that might be coming from uh, a, a free and open source software contrib contrib contribution role or how could you uh, make that more friendly and or have you ever considered the idea of letting employees keep copyright in their, in their projects? So, uh, as, how do I say this? Um, implementing change in a corporate context is a slow process, especially when uh, you're, <laughs> so much laugh, especially when you're, when you're starting in an organization that already has thousands of people in it, right? Um, and so coming into uh, an onboarding process, an employee onboarding process uh, that has already been defined by legal entities and culture and everything over time, um, and trying to upend that out of the gate is, is a hard thing to do. Um, so I see it as you know a, a, a long game and sometimes it's a game of inches. Like let's get the open source guidance in front of people as part of the onboarding. Let's get a half an hour of the onboarding process so that we can talk about what policies are and, what, and, and how things work and um, uh, what sort of the, the guardrails are for the ways that you might uh, run afoul uh, of policy uh, and, and take things from there. Uh, that's how we've been approaching it. One of the interesting things at Microsoft is we actually have a number of employees who uh, are maintainers of popular software packages you'd use, whether it's Webpack or Moment or Lodash if you're in the node world. Uh, some of the key maintainers work at Microsoft, but oddly, their job is not to work on those things. Those are things, that's stuff that they do on their own time. Sometimes it's a bit tangential to their work and they do it in, on work time. So the, the point here is that we do have a policy in place. Uh, we call it the moonlighting policy. And it's a, it's, a, just, you know, it's a negotiation or a discussion with your management. This applies to everybody. Like our, the secretaries, the admin, you know, everybody has the same policy. And uh, you, it's, it becomes a discussion with your management as to, you know, I want to work on this project. Uh, I want to do it in my spare time. It, it might intersect somewhat with my work or something, and it becomes a discussion. Uh, so there's no one in a company, you know, a big company of thousands of people, uh, there's no one answer that you can have that just says that. Uh, but I think we've got a, you know, it's suitably vague, which can be frustrating, but it's also flexible enough to handle a bunch of different cases. Um, I think it's becoming increasingly important to allow for people to uh, come in and continue to do work on the projects that they had been working on. Um, I am still working on a policy uh, within the company in terms of, uh, you know, some of the things Jeff covered and Dwayne covered, which is, uh, can I moonlight uh, and contribute to projects that I want? Can I? do personal uh, you know, con contributions to projects that I believe in which have nothing to do with my work. Uh, can I bring my copyrights over, right, and, and continue to maintain those copyrights, etc. I know some folks who are, who've been in open source for a very long time, like GitHub, have, have kind of uh, created some very progressive policies, but um, we came into this just very recently, so we're still working through, you know, how to address this issue and and do it fairly. Yeah. So let's see. Um, you know, at, at at Cisco, the the default policy is anything you do on company time or with company resources gets the the company, you know, copyright. Um, for most people, that's that's not really a problem. Um, you know. It's, it's uh, still relatively easy to open source something. It just has that copyright. You know, I haven't really been involved too much in this, but if, if that was somehow going to be a problem to you contributing to uh, some other open source process, then, you know, th th that can change, right? There's some flexibility in there. You know, this is just the default is for it to have the Cisco copyright. So um, in terms of coming in and when you first get hired, I, I think the thing to do is just to have 
a discussion around, well, these are the things I already am contributing to or I want to contribute to, and putting a Cisco copyright won't fly within that arena for these reasons, and then make sure that that's understood coming in. Um, but there's no reason that it also can't happen after you are in and then start contributing. So, so far I haven't really seen that be a, a big, big problem. Okay, well, thank you for those, uh, those answers. And I have a ton more questions, but I want to give everybody here an opportunity to ask questions too. So I'm going to pass the mic to Karen and let you ask some questions of our panelists. Also, if anybody lost uh, a thing of pencil leads for mechanical pencil, they're down here. The um, tiniest found object. That's <laughs> Actually, uh, I have, I think, three, two comments and a question on just this last topic. And one is, so the first comment is, is that these are all very large companies. Um, we were, when we, so it's very hard, to, I agree it's very hard to make these changes. I will say that at um, the SCALE conference last year, we were talking about contract patch and we asked the audience, of, it was maybe 50 people in the room, how many of them had been able to negotiate an open source change in their agreement and a good half of the audience at least put their hand up that they had been able to do that. Wow. So there's a lot of employers that are sm much smaller who are willing to, to deal with that. to allow ownership of copyright by, by employees. Um, a, a, second, um, a second way to slice the cake on that, and this is sort of my pushing back on you when you say, oh, this is so hard, this is so hard, it's corporate culture, it's hard to change. Because what really has to, because ha I don't know that it's, um, that it's necessary that the, that the employee own the copyright. What, why, why don't you as an employer promise that that work will be released under an open source license instead and come about it? Come about it to the back door that way. Um, I'm going to give it to Dwayne. Yeah. So I, I actually don't don't remember. I almost want to see the video. I can't remember if I said hard or slow. Um, I, I, I think I think that both can be can be can be true. Um, I think it's worth mentioning that uh, if you look at the risk profile of Indeed versus Microsoft versus Comcast versus Cisco, right? Um, the kinds of contributions employees are going to be making at Indeed, there aren't a lot of open source projects centered around connecting employers and job applicants, right? Um, and so I, I struggle to think of an open source contribution that an employee would want to make on their own time that wouldn't just be fine. Uh, and so we may be a little cavalier with policy, but I think it's because our, our risk profile is fairly low compared to shipping set-top boxes or routers with embedded Linux in them or everything possible that you can try to ship, right? <laughs> um, good, good idea or bad. <laughs> um, uh, uh, and so it, it's, it's very hard to give a one answer for everyone kind of thing. As far as can we commit to the employees that the open source work that they do uh, uh, or modifications to free and open source software that they do, they can give back to the community and we'll give back, give them back to the community. We haven't made a formal promise to that, but that's generally been our policy. Yeah, and I think my approach has been kind of to that second alternative where you're saying, you know, put the Cisco copyright, but just, you know, make it, what I've tried to do is make it as easy as possible to uh, release code as open source. And I guess what uh, I saw a good talk about, you know, people just following the path of least resistance. And whatever that path of least resistance is, th that's where, you know, people are going to go. So what I've tried to do is insert some good kind of open source principles, I guess, into that path of least resistance instead of fighting the whole copyright thing, and, and maybe this, some of this is my own ignorance of, of legal issues, but it's like I kind of see like I don't need to fight that one. I'm fine with the Cisco copyright. As long as we have a good, well understood, easy to find, and relatively fast and straightforward way to open source something, which um, you know, we actually do, and uh, that to me seems to be an okay solution. Um, I would like to come back to the question, how do you measure that, uh, as you uh, ask, and go a little bit further. Uh, I'm very curious about, as private companies, as profit-driven models, uh, first of all, 
how did you jump in and first of all why why what is the spark what is the initial motivation it is business driven does it come from the base uh, and uh, how how do you position yourself today are you still in an exploratory phase with dealing with uh, uh, private code and, and, and open code and if you are m even more mature do you put in place or do you plan, plan to put in place a kind of governance framework to manage what do we do as private out code and what do we do uh, uh, with, with open code and how do we decide with what rules to have a, a full blended business model so that that was a lot of questions there so uh, yeah yeah um, I, I know for us um, the reason we felt that it was important to have an open source program office um, was we felt that this is the way um, people develop today and this is the way companies should innovate and we wanted to be a technology innovator and so the way you do it is by establishing, at least we did, establishing a center of excellence so that developers didn't have to do the hard work of figuring out which license and how to, what's the process for open sourcing, etc. They could just come to one place and they could get all that help and get that support they needed to make that happen. And uh, I, I think it's, it's worked quite well. It, it, is, it is a business differentiator. It helps us get our products to market faster. It helps us cut cost. It helps us attract talent. Um, and it's, it's a real battle for talent today. And um, offering good open source policies and good open source support is a huge differentiator in, in attracting talent. So it's been it's been quite a journey for us, and like I work a, I drive the open source program on a what I used to call a maturity model. Now I call it an engagement model. Uh, we started out you know a few years ago in denial, and and uh, we progressed to like tolerant and hype, is sort of a you know peers of, of one another. And I'd say right now we're kind of at proficient, right? And the reason why we instituted the, the programs office is because we recognize that they are dabbling with the tolerant level of maturity. Was, uh, was very focused through a small, relatively speaking, set of people that all open source in the company went through them. And that's just not going to scale, right? So we decided that we would you know, essentially blow that up, distribute everybody in the company could do open source, but we still needed some level of management and governance over that process. That was what was going to get us to proficient across the company. And frankly, that's been, we've been at three years now trying to get proficient. And I would say we're, we're getting there, like we're pretty close. It's still, you know, it's, it, we've got some parts of the company that are amazing, like their mastery and they're, they're really doing well on the engagement scale. Uh, but the bulk of the company is getting to proficient. And it's really a lot of the things, Nithya, that, that you mentioned that motivated us to do this. Uh, but the recognition that uh, the phrase I like to use, it came from somebody that I, in the company that I don't remember and I, I won't quote their name, but it's basically, uh, it, it's not enough to aspire to be world class when everybody else starts there, mm -hmm. right? And we used to write software by just starting with, okay, let's, I think we're going to have a database system. So you crack open your laptop, you know, new file, write a database system. That's, that was the Microsoft way of writing code, you know, previously. But that clearly doesn't work when you can go out there and get, you know, MongoDB, Postgres, with, with all these other uh, open source databases that everybody else just starts with. And if you make your own, then you don't get to engage with all that eco ecosystem that's around all of those, uh, those other ones. And the last 5%, why are we doing, you know, we need 5% different than what they've already got. Why are we doing that? So the recognition at a core business level that it doesn't make sense to be building all of our own stuff when we can engage with people in the community, help them, help us, accelerate the industry as a whole, and really deliver the value that our customers want. They don't care whether we've got some cool new database under the cover or yet another UI framework. They care that they can write their Word documents or run Excel or run on Azure or whatever, like our products. So we can really drive where we differentiate where we provide the value, but build on, uh, on and with uh, software from others. There was a question over here. No, it, it's fine. Do we, were you done? Yeah. Um, so uh, I work at a relatively small 
company. We're about 80, 90 people. And we just started an open source working group um, that I guess I'm kind of driving. And so I'd love some tips on like what to do, what to drive. Uh, I guess one area is we have uh, a lot of libraries uh, for the Golang that we have, and they are central to our business, but don't really contain any business logic to them. But how, do you? The community is not going to be like, oh wow, that's exactly the library I've been looking for. Is that something that we still push out? You know, we try to hit that 50% of the, our developers pushing to open source. Uh, like, where do we go there? And and if you want to touch on helping to choose licensing, I, I think we're going the path of least resistance with the MIT. Like, pff, yeah, okay, that doesn't matter. We'll just throw it out there. But <laughs> so any uh, input would be great. So I'll I'll, I'll take the the second one first in the legal room and say I'm not your lawyer um, and, and I'm not a lawyer. Um, seek legal counsel when it comes to choosing your license or something from someone more informed. Um, there's plenty of them in, in the room here uh, and I believe me you could talk for the rest of the remaining two days to them about only that. Um, as far as you know you've got a bunch of Go libraries that crucial to your business, no critical business logic and maybe the community doesn't want them my philosophy tends to be that if there's not someone else who wants to be a contributor to the code, it's likely that you're just polluting the stream with code that nobody wants, right? Um, there might be other reasons to push code out there. Uh, you know, it might be academically interesting or, uh, or, or something like that. Um, but really, if nobody else wants it, I would, you could put it out, but then we already have a discoverability problem when it comes to finding software. Um, and so ju do that judiciously. Um, I would say the most important thing is that when someone shows up to your project, it's very clear to them what this is, what kind of response time they should get from maintenance, or what kind of level of maintenance it's in. If you want to push libraries out uh, um, that people might want to use, but don't intend to maintain them, make sure the person who lands there knows that immediately and how to get a hold of you if they have questions. Um, is, is, is what I would say, and, and they're all they all have. Thank you, please. So, uh, I would go down roughly what you were saying, but I'd also think uh, look internally and see if you can make an open source ish an inner source culture inside the company. So you don't have to actually open source it. You can be a small company, but still you can you can have people who are working in different parts of the company collaborating on those libraries and working together and sharing ideas. I differ a little bit on, on what Dwayne said in that, yeah, you can pollute the stream, but don't presume that you know, you're not special. I'm sorry, you're not, right? And, and so don't presume that there isn't somebody else out there who might want to be doing, so. they might just take your stuff and run with it, and that's cool, you know, that's fine, because you might find somebody else's stuff and you'll be able to use it. Or they might come and contribute. So you know, making the clarity, absolutely, that's one of the biggest, the discoverability problem that we have right now is horrible. And you show up to a project, you don't know whether it's dead, whether it's alive, what, you know, what's going on. And that's a really big problem. So definitely go down that path. But I would, I, I try to default to open, uh, but, but, but clarity, right? You need to be clear about what it is you're doing. And, but I would go for open first. So I'm addressing a different one which is congratulations on starting an open source working group. I think in, in a small company, that's the way to go with lots of volunteers and, and lots of little time. Uh, and as you scale, you, you'll probably create more of a dedicated one. And if you're looking for more resources on how to create an open source program office, there's a group called the to-do group, t-o-d-o group dot com, dot com, right? Or dot org, sorry, um, which which has a lot of case studies and journals and and uh, resources on how to start your own program office. Yeah, and the other thing, I, I think you know, there's big open source projects, there's small open source projects. Most of what I'm dealing with are lots and lots of very small open source projects. Uh, you know, just some sample code around how to use an API or something like that. So then in having that discussion of, well, should we open source it or, or not, I mean, yeah, we don't want to throw a bunch of junk out there um, that's not being maintained. But so I think the thing to do is make sure that the, you know, of course the readme has to be good and describe how to use the software. 
but whether it's in the README or in a contributing file, you know, we make sure we put something about what are our goals with this? Are we trying to start a community around it? Are, are we welcoming contributions? Or is the engineer who built it just like, hey, I want people to see an example, but you know, I don't really want bug fixes or extensions. Just if this helps you copy, start using it, fine. If it doesn't, you know, so just, just put that disclaimer out there too of, of what are your intentions. And oftentimes that will influence um, your license choice too, I think, right? What, depending on what you want the longevity and the kind of give back sort of model of this to be. So um, there's, a, there's a lot of old, mature uh, code out there down in the guts of uh, software infrastructure that doesn't have a lot of maintainers. And uh, I'm wondering if your companies have been thinking about how to contribute to the maintenance of some of that really vital code, uh, you know, some of the security problems that mm -hmm. the internet has run into uh, have been really caused by uh, just not enough maintenance on that stuff. Can you guys talk a little about that? Yeah, I can talk a, a little bit. I mean, I know there have been some community efforts to try to address that, like, you know, within the Linux Foundation, there's, uh, I forget what it is, core but the- Core infrastructure initiative. You, yeah, the core infrastructure, thank you. Um, so, it, I mean, so one thing is contributing with money towards that initiative. The other way is also by contributing with, with developers in some cases. Um, oftentimes the money at a large company is easier to do um, so I think start with that, but you know, if, if there's a skill set or a personal interest or whatever within the company, uh, that's also you know very welcome. So you know, both ways. And I agree, it's it's something we need to take care of and address. I mean, Charlie is exactly right. Um, it's easier to contribute to an effort, a centralized effort like that, which then looks at the underfunded or under-resourced but critical components like OpenSSL, I think, was one of them. Um, and then, you know, make sure that they are uh, well taken care of. Um, it's harder, though, to justify putting developers, like Charlie was saying, on uh, projects that we may not consume. Uh, as businesses, sometimes we tend to be very focused on working with communities that we actually use or somehow, you know, help us. And so it's harder to justify communities which we don't use, except through a core infrastructure initiative, maybe. Sorry. Yeah, mm. yeah uh, sustainability and, and survivability, durability of projects is actually a really big problem. And, and we've been looking at, you know, we do a lot of the same things, core inf infrastructure and that sort of thing that has been discussed previously. But we're trying to look at models for, you know, how would we actually do this on a more widespread basis? Uh, you know, waiting until there's heart bleed and then everybody jumping in and trying to, you know, get the two Steves to fix everything. That, that's, you know, that's, a, that's okay, but that's a retroactive. We're trying to look more proactive is how, how can we manage to avoid these problems. But it turns out to be a really hard, hard, uh, hard topic. And if you have any ideas, like, you know, come down and find me later because I'm, I'm really trying to figure this out. Uh, throwing money at the problem is, is not always workable. People, it, it turns out that not everybody just wants money to fix bugs or something, right? They want to do their thing. Uh, and so it, it is a challenge, and we, I don't know how to solve it. I would love your help in figuring out how to solve it because we actually really do want to solve it. So. I, I was going to say, I have ideas and come to my talk, and then you said, but money is sometimes not the solution. I said, well, I still have ideas, but maybe come to my talk. Um, and at the risk of being pluggish, I have a talk tomorrow I'd like you to come to, or I can talk to you about it afterwards. Um, the, uh, the drive for wider contribution that we've been taking on has largely been focused, um, oh, the next place to focus is making sure that we're contributing into the things that we depend on as a company. Um, uh, the problem is uh, when you do everything, you depend on everything, right? Um, and if we look at the inventory of libraries and software that is deployed across Indeed Stack, there's a lot of everything in there. Um, my, my hope um, is that as our tooling continues to evolve, I can uh, get some insights into where we have contribution activity where our larger dependencies are and make sure that if there's a mismatch between those two, we are working to highlight the projects where it makes sense for us to be contributing more 
um, and drive programs internally to encourage contribution in those areas. Uh, we haven't done a lot of that focused on project need externally. We have done a lot of uh, driving for, if you want to get involved for the first time, if you've never made an open source contribution and you want to get started, here are some things we know that we use that are welcoming to newcomers, and here are some other projects that are just generally welcoming to newcomers uh, to get people onboarded into the process. Um, oh, he's got the mic. So something that I observe usually about large companies is that they start to engage in free and open source software for their own products, either because they want the community or the ecosystem that they are building to thrive, like more developers use it, or they want actually the code contributions back from the developers. So there are two perfectly fine reasons, but also like to the benefit of the company. Mm -hmm. What is missing that I observe is are the people who are not, who don't have the expertise or simply time to contribute back to the software project, or they are simply not developers, but they would benefit if the source code, for example, for that internet router in their home is available so that if there is a glitch that is very specific to their use of the software, can be fixed by having the source code and fixing it. But unfortunately, the feedback loop that the company gets from the developers is very short, but from these people, the very end users who are not developers, the feedback loop, the benefit that the company gets by releasing the source code for their products is quite large or quite long. What can be done to somehow, so I'm speaking purely from a very end user freedom perspective. Mm -hmm. What can companies do to shorten this feedback loop so that it is also practical or beneficial for the companies to release source code even if it does not help thrive their platform that they are building or does not add anything to the source code that they are developing? I know it's a very difficult question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We're, we're all going to avoid eye contact with each other for a moment. <laughs> well, it's a, it's a tough one. And we have routers in, in people's homes. Um, and if it's based on open and free software, we do provide the source code for the, the GPL components, so the, you know, the, the pieces, but not for everything. And... Um, I, I don't know enough about um, the requests that we get from customers to make that code available. I don't know how many of our consumers actually are interested in it or want to modify it or want to you know play with it. So I couldn't answer um, you know what the the need is and how we would respond to it. Um, so so yeah, unsatisfactory answer, but. Yeah, I'm not sure I understand your question. Are you saying there's, uh, say, a product or a service that is 80% uh, of its open source code and 20% of its not, and how do we get that other 20% to be open source? Or, or, how to or, or, empower the very end user to fix the problem, and by fixing that problem, it would not benefit your company, but it will solve their problem. Nevertheless, okay. like, there is the installation script or the whatever is yeah. missing from that thing. I, I guess I have a hard time envisioning that because to me, I mean, customer satisfaction is kind of the number one success of the product. So if, if there's a, a customer who has an issue and let, let's say, um, you know, the code is open source and it's on GitHub and someone comes and opens an issue saying that they're having this problem and, you know, fixing it, it would be in the best interest. I mean, we would want to fix that. So I guess that may, that's why I think I'm not quite understanding your question. We would definitely, um, even if it didn't make the software perform better. You are thinking of a developer, yeah. not a, someone who does not, like it's, I mean, it's not going to contact you. It's just fixing their own problem because they don't have the expertise to come back and bring this back. Uh, we're going to have to repeat whatever it is that is being said down there because it's not in the recording. 
think we were wrapping it up. Okay, so okay. we'll just move to the next a question. I actually want to build up on the on the previous question. So to be to be a little more exact or detailed here, assuming I buy, I buy a uh, large Cisco device for a um, reasonable amount of money, <clears throat> and um, most stuff is open sourced, and it could actually be driven to a point that you could open source like all of the um, all of the software parts of the product. So when you if sorry if you if you purely theoretically would go bankrupt on the next day, then I'd be standing there and I would have zero support and I would never ever have the option ever to get any support for that device ever. If that stuff is on GitHub, I can just hire your ex-employees, which are now looking for jobs, and um, they, can, they can help me uh, maintain that, that stuff. Sure. So it can, you could even, you could even um, uh, develop that thought to a point where uh, the, since the systems live, live on when a particular business case fails, um, it can be used to build new business, business cases on, right? So it's, um, there's, there's, an, there's a commercial opportunity there as well. Oh, maybe okay. that helps. Y y yeah, I, I agree. And, and there's lots of cases where, um, you know, we, we do have the, the, the source code has been open source. If you look at a product uh, or a, something like VPP and FDIO, you have a lot of Cisco people contributing to it. The entire thing is open sourced. Um, that is used in combination with other product, yeah, products as like its core. And then there may be other management software or something on top of it that is not open sourced. And that whole thing is offered as a, you know a product. Um, I, I can't say that you know I'm ever going to make Cisco open source everything. But what I can tell you is a higher and higher percentage of code is being open sourced, and that's in a good direction. And then you know people can come on like the GitHub community and submit issues and and so I think uh, you know we're moving in the right direction there it's, but it's not like everything's going to be open source I agree that would be fantastic but um, you know we're just we're moving closer to it one last thing no. yeah the person said that they're paying money for it they should have that um, are we do we have time for one more question or if it's really quick Does anybody have a I'll ask, is, is um, I, so just building, just asking, following up on what Nitya said before, um, are, for, for all of you, are, um, when requests for source code come into your companies, are, is that sort of under your purview? Do you see, do you see that? Is that part of your workflow? I, I think one of the best practices of uh, open chain, for example, is that there's an am, ombudsman, I think that's the way to pronounce it, for each company so that people can actually request information or source code, et cetera. And we do have an email address that they can write to. And then we make sure to contact the right team in the company and make sure that they are able to fulfill the request for the source code. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's one of the you know key roles under the model of we're doing governance and compliance with the uh, with the licenses. So uh, certainly, when people request, if we have a, we we maintain a site thirdpartycode.microsoft.com, you can go there, find any of our products, and try to download it. You know, find the the uh, copyleft code that's involved and download it there. If for some reason it's not there, there's a link and you can click it and send us an email, and then my team gets that and we go and figure out why it's not there. You know, did something bad happen? Like something wrong happened in the build system or whatever? <clears throat> and then, and we also interestingly, and please don't do this. <laughs> but they, they, people interesting often send us emails saying, "Could you please open source Microsoft Paint <laughs> or Notepad, which we are doing, uh, or uh, you know, Money or uh, World?" Well, what's, what, there's one of the game ones that anyway. And, and we we try to we go and actually you know often just for fun because. Well, that's not just for fun. For interest's sake, we go and, and ask the teams. We try to track down the teams and ask them, you know, what, what do you think? And, you know, typically, honestly, it's no, right? Because the, the actual value in open sourcing it is a very, it's very challenging to open source. It's all embedded in some big build system or whatever. But, yes, we are trying to make sure that people who want the source code can get it. Could you open source my notes, please? <laughs> do you really want it? <laughs> oh, it, so, so Bradley asked if we could open source Windows, and I asked if we really, if you really wanted it. So, fair, fair enough. Well, we've come to the end of our time, and I just want to uh, enthusiastically thank Dwayne, Jeff, Nitya, and Jeff.
for coming to talk to us.